This is Michael Smith of MedPage Today. I'm here at the Conference on Retroviruses and Opportunistic Infections. I'm talking with Dr. Maria Waver of Johns Hopkins University. With colleagues, Dr. Waver has spent several years working um, in Africa on the issue of circumcision and HIV acquisition. Um, Dr. Waver, what do we know about what circumcision, the effect of circumcision on, on getting HIV? In negative males, circumcision has been found to be an incredibly effective method of reducing male risk. There have now been three large trials, including the trial we did in Rakai, Uganda, that showed that if adult men became circumcised, they reduced their risk of acquiring HIV by between 50 and 60 percent. So it's not 100 percent effective, but on the other hand, it certainly does reduce risk. And so you uh, asked yourself the question, uh, if it reduces the risk of, of acquisition, it presumably reduces the risk of transmission to female partners, but you ask yourself the question, what about HIV positive men? Why did you ask that one? We were very interested in finding out what the effects of circumcision might be in HIV positive men, simply because in in Africa, there are a large proportion of men are HIV positive, and once circumcision programs become more widespread, more available, it's very likely that HIV positive men will also seek the procedure. Partly, you don't want to be the only guy on the block who hasn't been circumcised. So we wanted to know whether circumcision was going to be safe in HIV positive men, but also we had some previous data that were not as strong as a randomized trial, but that from observations that suggested that if an HIV positive man was circumcised, then he had a reduced risk of transmitting HIV to his female partner. Well, that was simply an observation. So you decided to test this in a randomized controlled trial. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that trial. Within uh, the district in Uganda where we work, we did a, a trial in positive men that was run in parallel to one of the trials we did in HIV negative men. So we enrolled HIV positive men. They were randomly assigned to either being circumcised immediately or waiting a couple years to be circumcised. And then we invited them to invite their spouses to be enrolled and then to be followed up. And of the men, uh, of the positive men who were uh, married, the great majority invited their spouse to become enrolled. Now, some of the spouses were already HIV positive, so we were not able to get data on whether circumcision would protect them from acquiring HIV. They already had HIV. But we wound up ultimately with 250 couples where the woman was negative, the man was positive, and the man had been randomized to either get circumcision or to wait two years. And within those 250 couples, we concentrated in particular on 92 couples of men who had been circumcised who enrolled at the same time as the men who had been circumcised, and 68 couples of men who had not been circumcised where the woman was positive and where she enrolled at the same time as the partner. And this was our primary group of analysis. Now, what we found is, stepping back to the positive men, we found a benefit to the positive men of becoming circumcised. They had fewer genital ulcers, which in HIV positive men can be a real problem. So this was a positive benefit. We also found that circumcision was safe in these men. However, disappointingly, when we looked at the women partners of the positive men who had been circumcised compared to the partners of the men who had not been circumcised, we actually found a slightly higher rate of transmission from the positive circumcised men than from the negative than from the positive uncircumcised men. So there seems to be almost a, a slight trend in the, in, the, in the wrong direction. A trend in the wrong direction, not statistically significant, so these data cannot be considered definitive, but we certainly were not seeing the expected protection of the women that we had expected. Now, we did additional further analyses, and it would seem that most of the increased risk of transmission from positive circumcised men to partners occurred in those couples where the couple undertook sexual intercourse before the surgical wound was completely healed. That makes sense. If you have a surgical wound that where there's still inflammation, where there still might be some bleeding, where you don't have complete keratinization of the remaining mucosa, then that could, in effect, increase the transmission of virus. And our hypothesis now is it's the early resumption of sex that proved to be problematic in these couples. 
Is there a next step that you can take uh, to either confirm or refute that hypothesis? What, what further research are you undertaking? Well, within um, our own, when I say our own study site, this is a study site where we've been working for 20 years with 400 excellent Ugandan collaborators, physicians, scientists, etc., and with the Ugandan Ministry of Health. Within uh, the Rakai setting, we are providing male circumcision as a service now to negative men, but also to positive men, because again, we don't want them to become stigmatized if they're refused the service, and we now know that circumcision has a benefit for the positive man. So we feel that ethically, we have to be able to provide it as a service to both positive, uh, to both infected and uninfected men. What we are doing through the service provision is that we are doing very, very intensive follow-up of a group of negative men, but also all positive men, to look much more detail at how long does it take for the surgical wound to heal completely in the positive men, and we'll also continue to follow their partners. We're also obviously letting the whole population know what the results of our findings were. But we're also recommending to the international HIV research community that we probably need a couple of more trials of circumcision in positive men to really nail down this issue. But of course, studies where the positive men and their partners were clearly told that up to now we haven't seen a benefit to women of the procedure and that early resumption of sex may be actually dangerous. That sounds like a, uh, a program for, for a few years. Thank you very much, Dr. Weber. Thank you. This is Michael Smith, MedPage Today.